good evening everyone on behalf of the indian school of business and the nehru center it's my great pleasure in welcoming you all to this very wonderful evening here in london uh, this is as you all know a celebratory event to celebrate two decades of isb the indian school of business uh, we are very thankful to the nehru center shri amish tripathi the director uh, and everybody else for their sort of you know you know for hosting us this evening uh, india uk relations have withstood the test of time our honorable prime minister has described it as a living bridge a living bridge of people language ideas culture education and much more isb is proud of its steadily deepening relationships with various constituents in the uk the indian school of business has been unique both in the way it has come into being and in the way it has grown over the course of its past two decades born out of the collective vision of several star stalwarts of industry and global thought leaders from academia isb has been distinct in many aspects from the world go uh, today's event we will have dean madan pilutla the dean of indian school of business say a few words about isb and present a sort of a very mini version of the state of the school uh, and we have before that we'll have a short video about isb Uh, and then we'll have professor krishnamurthy subramanian from isb uh, sort of give us keynote address and a panel discussion featuring mr sunil kant munjal mem a founding member of the isb executive board uh, and uh, professor subbu moderated by shri amish tripathi uh, i also want to recognize and welcome sir dominic asquith the former british high commissioner to india uh, here this evening who is amidst us uh, and you know just as a small you know sort of uh, anecdotal thing he's is one of uh, those uh, one of the ambassadors in india who's actually been to both our campuses many times over so sir dominic thank you very much uh, and pleasure to have you here with us uh, this evening and for all those of you celebrating uh, onam today happy onam uh, and with those few words i want to sort of now uh, you know invite you all to watch this short movie uh, about isb thank you
को यूनिकॉन्स निर्माण में उनकी भूमिका रही है ये आई के लिए उपलब्धि तो है ही है पूरे देश के लिए गर्व का विषय भी of with this kind of capability a school with this kind of resources it has to aim really really high so the goals will be that high you know we'll set those goals that high but we'll also come up with a plan about what are the steps that we need to be taking so that we'll be achieving those goals in 5 years and set ourselves up so that we become a world beating business school in the not so distant future thank you thank you very much uh, you heard uh, dean pilutla talk about the goals and the future uh, but i now invite him here since he's here with us in person to share some of those with you all today and also talk a little bit about how the school has progressed over the past two decades dean pilutla good evening welcome Uh, thank you for braving the rain uh, and coming here uh, to uh, to help us celebrate uh, ISB at 20 years this um, uh, i know you're very busy people uh, i know that uh, you have lots of things to do uh, but it means a lot uh, to us uh, that you come here and you celebrate uh, with us uh, you have a great um, uh, great evening planned you know so there are some star speakers uh, one just following me uh, subhu is going to uh, follow me in a few minutes so i'm not going to keep you away uh, from him uh, and the very distinguished uh, panel uh, that uh, so you have uh, uh, amish here you have sunil who uh, sunil munjal who is a, a founding uh, board member of the school so let me start off by saying that my association with uh, the school uh, is uh, uh, is 20 plus years uh, about uh, 20 odd years ago uh, i was sitting in a pub just outside uh, london business school london business school has a pub on its uh, premises you uh, you should know that you know so uh, it's called the windsor uh, so i was sitting there i was having a drink uh, and uh, sumantra ghoshal uh, walked in and uh, sumantra was uh, those of you who knew sumantra a very charismatic figure a bit of a demi god uh, he uh, he had a presence and when he entered a room uh, all eyes went uh, went towards him so my friend anand and i we were looking at him we were sitting with someone else he just walks up to uh, to us and he he asks me uh, he says uh, do you want to be involved with the isb and i'd heard about the isb i'd heard who the people were behind uh, the isb uh, and also the different uh, faculty members who were involved there so i felt very honored i immediately said yes i had no clue what he wanted me to teach i had no clue uh, whether uh, they were going to pay me any money i had no clue whether i had to buy my own ticket to go there to teach and none of those things you know i just said yes to sumantra i'm so glad i did you know so i'm so glad i did i went to isb uh, in uh, december of uh, 2001 the founding batch there are a few of you uh, from the founding batch here uh, so i taught uh, there the first uh, batch at uh, in the first the founding batch at uh, at isb uh, and i would rate that as among my most amazing teaching experiences uh, going back to india teaching your own people uh, people who understand your jokes people who uh, uh, who kind of get you uh, was uh, was something that uh, that i enjoyed so much so my association began then and it continued uh, all the way till uh, till now Uh, at the time when i said uh, yes uh, you know knowing fully well the kind of the founding conditions of the school uh, but it was still an idea right so this was an idea uh, where uh, there are a group of very talented people uh, decided that they were going to build a world beating business school in india but there was no structure there was no uh, uh, physical infrastructure uh, there was uh, the curriculum was uh, was just being designed uh, so it was just an idea at that point in uh, uh, at time uh, but uh, they had you know the audacity to believe that they were going to build a world beating school and here we are today you know so uh, i did not expect then when i first went there i was honored then uh, to be asked to come and teach there i'm even more honored uh, when uh, i was named uh, the dean of the school uh, about a year ago i didn't expect uh, to be standing here and talking to you about isb at 20 and about this glorious institution 
a lot has happened in the 20 years. Uh, and uh, 20, there are many different people that we need to thank. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the vision of the, of the founding board. Uh, obviously, the people who, uh, the, the faculty members uh, from the Indian diaspora, people from, we all know people from Kellogg, we know people from Wharton, people from the London Business School, uh, but also you had people from Chicago, from Stanford, from just about any school, name a good school in, uh, in the United States, they were involved in the inception of, of the school. Uh, so we we pay uh, we uh, we pay our uh, uh, there is we owe a debt of gratitude to these people that they started off this great institution, uh, but also the institution grew thanks to the efforts, the passion, uh, and the immense hard work uh, that the employees uh, and uh, the the faculty in the ISB have put over the last 20 years. Uh, today, I do believe, you know, that we are a world-class school. Uh, we are a, we are the top-ranked school in India, uh, but we want to be something a lot better, you know. So the goal for us is is a lot better. So let's just let me just you know go down a little and talk to you about what the school is like uh, at at this point in, in in time. Just give you a glimpse. You saw that in the video. You saw a lot of the different things that we do. But let me just give you a glimpse and then say what is the future? What does the future hold for us? So ISB was founded uh, with a vision to be a world-class school from day one. I recently I had the pleasure of uh, uh, of listening to Pramat, uh, uh, you know, Pramat regales Pramat Sinha was the founding dean, uh, regales people with uh, a lot of the different stories about the founding of ISB. But this is something that he said, which I find to be quite profound. Uh, for people who are trying to build world-class institutions, he said, excellence is not scalable. You have to be excellent from day one. You can build in terms of the numbers that you're educating. You can build in terms of the imprint that you're going to be having. But you need to bake in excellence into the DNA from day one. And that's what I believe that the school, really, the architects of the ISB, they believed in that. And that's what they did right from the beginning. I do think that the school has stayed true to this vision by consistently setting and bettering the benchmarks that it is setting for itself. I believe now that we are a flag bearer for management institutions in India that want to be research led. You know? So we are the flag bearer for that. And I do think that our founding conditions have helped us considerably in, in doing that. So research has always been the backbone of our vision to be a leader in management education. So we are the only business school that is ranked in the FT. So we're looking in, in terms of being ranked in, uh, in research. We are the only school that has been ranked in the FT. Uh, all of our faculty, we have 66 resident faculty. We have 200 plus visiting faculty. Uh, all of them, you know, if you think about the combined knowledge base that these people are generating, uh, they have, like, you know, they publish in some of the top journals, and the expertise that we bring under one roof in the ISB is, is somewhat unparalleled. In addition to the fact that, you know, there is a lot of very, very high quality research that is being done in India, in, in the ISB, the thing that I just want to, uh, uh, want to highlight is, is something uh, that, uh, that ISB, you know, the best researchers in ISB are exemplars of. They're trained in the world's best business schools, right? So they're trained in the world, uh, world's best business schools, best social science programs, and so on. But when they come to India, they look at India as a laboratory where they can study problems that are relevant to a huge percentage of the world population. We are a big country. But the problems that we are solving in India are probably also relevant to a lot of economies uh, which are you know, not developed economies, which are poorer economies where information itself and data itself is a little hard to gather. Uh, policies themselves need to be tweaked. Policies need to be changed. So India becomes the laboratory in which our researchers, our top, top researchers, they do their research, they publish them in world-class journals. But this research is something that gets picked up and can be used by a lot of different parts of the world, which have had usually a developed economy focus, a Western kind of a focus. We also in the ISB, right from the beginning, uh, we've always believed in, we, we're talking about India relevance, we're talking about global eminence, okay? So this is, this is the motto that we have. So we want to do India relevant work, but we want to be globally respected. But when we're talking about India relevant work, we've also in ISB very consciously, we've set up research centers and research institutes. These serve as a bridge between academia, that's who we are, practitioners, policy makers, and industry in order not just to foster high quality research, 
but also to drive societal impact. So that's what our centers and our research institutes, they're doing a lot of. Uh, in, uh, so we have nine of them, and they're doing a lot of that. Our own flagship postgraduate program uh, in management, it ranks number 32 in the Financial Times and number one in, uh, in India in the Financial Times ranking. I, for one, my faculty colleagues, the board definitely, we had a board meeting today, and uh, they told me, uh, and I agree, they're just pre preaching to the converted. We are not happy with this ranking. You know, 32 is not a ranking that we believe that a school of our capability, that is not where we want to peg ourselves. So we want to be among a handful of the schools that are out there in the world that people will consider to be world beating. So if people are talking about five, 10 schools, we want to be talked about in those five, 10 schools. So our ranking is good, but it is not good enough given who we are and the capabilities that we have. We now offer about 11 programs in management. Uh, it cu cuts across different seniority levels, domain specializations. We have programs, of, uh, we have a program, the, the uh, MBA equivalent, the PGP program. We have a program for people who come from family businesses and are going to go back to family businesses. We also have the equivalent of a PhD program because in addition uh, to serving the needs of industry, in addition to trying to train people who are going to become entrepreneurs, we also want to train people who will go into academe and spread the kind of rigor that we practice in the research that we do, we want them to spread it in, in India. Um, our exec education is growing, you know, so our reach is, uh, is, is really, really good. Uh, so uh, we have what we're calling a full stack executive education model. Our relationships with different companies is not transactional. We don't want to do a one-off kind of an exec education program. We want to be participants in their change. We want to be participants in their growth, and we want to help them innovate and become world-beating companies. Uh, so the Financial Times, again, ranks us number 38 in the world, uh, and number one in India when they're talking about our custom exec education rankings. Again, rankings that we're proud of, but something that we want to do a lot, lot more of. About a year ago, when I took over the deanship, you know, so and you saw this again at, uh, at the end, uh, I said, what I said is that, you know, our intent is to leverage our research capabilities and the immense knowledge of our faculty so that we can, uh, we can enhance our school's outreach and engage with external stake, uh, stakeholders. So what I hope to do as, as a result of that is that we as a school will become the role model for what business schools in a developing world should look like. As we are, we are embarking on our third, third decade, I think you know, we are doing quite a lot uh, with the government. Uh, as a prime example, we are the first, first B school, actually the first educational institution which was selected by the Capacity Building Commission of India it's the nodal body for skill development, knowledge and skill development uh, of the nation's civil services. We became their first knowledge partner, you know, so we're very proud of that, but then as a result of that, we've had a whole series of engagements. We have, we have increased dialogue with policymakers, administrators, and industry to offer ISB's research capabilities for capacity building, skilling, training, knowledge development, and nation building. Uh, you've, you just heard what the Prime Minister said, okay, and you also saw the tweet. So there cannot be a more ringing endorsement than when the Prime Minister of India, he says, one of the reasons that the world knows that India means business is institutions like the ISB. You know, what more can you think of as a, as a ringing endorsement of the kind of work we as a school have been doing? So I... I uh, two more things about impact that I want to say. You know, we're committed to doing things in India. As part of the national education policy, which we're very excited by, we think that there are a lot of good things that are going to come out, uh, come out of it. But as part of it, what we also want to do is engage the knowledge that we are creating, engage the kind of courses that we are creating in the services of helping MBA programs in India who do not have the capability to develop their own pedagogy or deliver their pedagogy. So this is something that we want to do quite a lot of. The final thing that I want to say is that we have recommitted to the idea that ISB is a school for entrepreneurs. Under the leadership of uh, Bhagwan Chaudhary, you know, so you know Bhagwan has been 
teaching right from the very beginning, uh, since the inception of ISB. Each year he's been coming and he's been teaching at the ISB. I'm delighted that he's there with us. But what under him, under his leadership, there is a body that we've created which is called iVenture at ISB. And iVenture is teaching together an ecosystem for entrepreneurship in India. There are a lot of exciting uh, things that, uh, that iVenture is doing. They're holding a conference in London in October. Those of you interested in understanding what is going on in entrepreneurship in India, I would strongly urge you to attend that conference that iVenture at ISB is doing along with the Wheeler Institute at the London Business School. I'm just con going to conclude by thanking two sets of people. First, our alumni. Thank you for doing so well as business leaders and, and founders of organizations across the globe. I'm, I, what I would say that you know there are a whole lot, load of achievements. A bunch of you have become CXOs. You've founded more than 600 organizations. I mean, found, uh, we have more than 600 founders among our 13,500 alumni. We also have among the 105 plus unicorns, whichever way you measure it, right? So there are 105 plus unicorns in India right now. 11 of them have either founders or co-founders from India. For a young school uh, and just one small school in a very large country like India, I think that's a pretty, pretty big achievement. Uh, so what I would like to say is thank you to, your, to our alumni, thank you. Uh, it's because of you that the school enjoys the reputation that it does. So thank you very much for, uh, the, for the success that you bring. I'd also like to uh, really, uh, my sincere gratitude to you, Amish uh, uh, Tripathi. Um, I know him from his books. It was wonderful actually seeing you in person. Uh, I had a little bit of a fan moment. I did tell him I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, the Shiva Triology, you know. So thank you, Amish and the Nehru Center for your graciousness in helping us organize this event. Uh, it is thanks to people like you uh, that ISB has grown to uh, what it is today. It's thanks to generosity of supporters like you. Uh, thank you again uh, to everyone uh, here to celebrate the milestone. Uh, and I think you have next, you're in for a treat, uh, you have Subu. Uh, when I say that uh, we as a school, we partner with the government, uh, I can't think of a more uh, a, a person who exemplifies it uh, more than Subu. So uh, he went, we loaned him to the government for three years. They loved him so much, he came back. Uh, within a few months, uh, they've again, they've asked uh, for him back. Uh, so I just spoke to him uh, today and I said, Subu, I hope you're still only going on leave because we still, uh, you're still ours, you know. You're not the government of India's, you're still us. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, and, uh, uh, and thank you for celebrating this uh, wonderful event with us. Thank you. Thank you, Madan. <clears throat> thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation of the State of the School report. Uh, I now invite uh, Shri Sunil Khan Munjal, uh, Chairman Hero Service, uh, Hero Enterprises, and also a founding member of the ISB Executive Board, to say a few words on this occasion. Lies, damned lies and statistics is the way the subject often gets introduced. And by the way, people use this all the time. Institutions to express where they stand use lots and lots of figures. And they are as confusing as they're revealing. But the interesting thing with this school is that for seven years, the first seven years, ISB re refused to present itself for any ranking. And the reason was, we only want to stand up and be counted when we are ready, when we genuinely stand where we believe we ought to. So, Madan, this is not new. So the habit of the school to earn all kinds of credits and kudos is not new. It's, it's happened from the beginning. But because the very idea was to focus, and Madan stole my lines, was to focus on excellence all the time in every aspect. I remember the early days when Rajat and Anil and Pramath and all were running around, literally scrambling across the globe, looking for support, looking for ideas, looking for people to get involved and engaged. And they had a very compelling pitch, very simple, 
but very compelling, that we'd like to make an institution which is the best of the best. How can you actually argue with that? And that brought in some of the, the best of the best from industry to get involved with the founding and with the board of the ISP. And it was not just from India. There was a separate board set up of global leaders. And that list of each one reads like a who's who of their respective fields. The many deans who have been with us, starting with Sumantra, by the way. Sumantra was, was like a thunderstorm. He was not just a presence. You could feel him coming from a distance. We unfortunately lost him too early. And that's when Pramod uh, took on the responsibility. We've had a series of outstanding individuals who've led this institution as chairs, as board members, as visiting faculty, as faculty, as advisors and guides. But the most enduring value, the measure, and the way the, the people outside look at the school is through you, is the product of the school, is the alums. And for us too, this is the true test as to what happens to you from when you come in, the first day when you walk in, and when you leave, when you graduate from, from the institution. What do you do outside? What do you do with your lives? What do you do with the jobs? What do you do with people around you? And the success there is not measured only in monetary terms. It is, of course, important to get recognized by designations. But to my mind, it's a lot more important to understand and to see what people around you say about you. How do you deal with people? I think that's a real test. Of course, you will learn econometrics, and you learn management techniques, and you learn all of, the, all of the fancy terms and jargon. But what matters is what you do every day to get to that long-term goal. So it's not just the goal. It's the journey which I think is as important. And ISP has a wonderful way of infusing this. It's almost magic, because it's only a one-year program. By the way, there have been lots and lots of discussion about the length of the program. Because in reality, it's not a one-year program. It's a lot more just packed into one year. Would you agree? Because I've heard this more than once, that you get no time to lift up your head and have the amount of fun you would like. Of course you have fun. But you probably like to have a little bit more when you're, uh, when you're in the school. So I think this is a unique experiment, and by the way, it is an experiment, because it is unlike anything else in the country. And there are very few like this in the world. Because in the early days, when it was being set up, this is one of the con conversations we used to have. What is it you're trying to emulate? Where do you learn from? So we looked at some of the best. The more interesting conversation was actually when we did the second one. Three of us, Analjeet, Sunil Mittal, and myself, we were standing in the Prime Minister's office in Delhi. And his principal secretary, who happened to be a friend of ours, because he used to be chief secretary of Punjab at one time. And all three of us, at some point, originally come from Punjab. So he's saying, since all three of you are here to together, can you come to my room? I want to have a conversation with you. So we said, of course. So he says, why don't you guys do something in Punjab? I said, what's wrong with you? Do you know what all we do in Punjab? He's saying, I know, but can you do a little more? I said, we have 30,000 kids studying in our schools. We have a B.Ed. college, M.Ed. college, medical college, nursing college, hospital. And I just read out the whole list to him, other than businesses, by the way, because he was not talking about business. And uh, he's saying, yeah, but there's a unique opportunity. The prime minister has just come back from Mohali and announced a complete education city in one of the sectors in Mohali. We have a plan to put up a business school there. 
and they had spoken, they had approached the, the Ministry of Labor and HR. By the way, the, the, uh, the business schools, the IIMs, do not come under an education ministry, interestingly. And he's saying they've said no. They're very busy. They're doing what they're doing. Why don't you guys grab this opportunity? Why don't you put up a business school here? And we all looked at each other. And without a word, by the way, we said, OK. We will certainly consider it. We will most likely do it. So we walked out of this room. And all three of us said, what the hell are we committing? You know, a business school is a serious commitment. And all of us run a variety of not-for-profits. Uh, but what he's talking about is something truly special. So we started talking to institutions uh, around the world to see if we could bring in a partnership. We spoke with one, then a second, then a third, and a fourth. When we spoke to Jagmohan Raju at Wharton, so Jagmohan was an old friend. He's saying, look, we already have a partnership with ISB. It is highly unlikely that Wharton's board will permit us to do a second one here. Two of you are already on the board of ISP. Why don't you just do another ISP? So interestingly, by the way, people point a finger and blame us. Jagmohan is the one to blame, actually. <laughs> and and um, so we said, actually, that sounds like a good idea. So we took the idea back to the next uh, board meeting at ISB in Hyderabad. And there was some to and, to and fro. And finally, we decided that we will do the second campus. It was not a long time since the first one had come up. And we will add something extra. So with the, the question was, we are doing what we are doing in Hyderabad. It has wonderful momentum. Uh, it was, of course, struggling uh, in, in those days. By the way, it's had lots of ups and downs in the early days, especially on the financials, because there's a massive spend. Just the capex to put up something like this is huge, and you all know what the facilities are like. And operating cost is not low either. While the fee was kept at about a pretty high level by Indian standards, very low by global standards, uh, it was still a struggle in the early days. And, and so the question was, so they said, then you guys have to put up all the money if you want to do this. And by that time, uh, Mickey Punj of Punj Lloyd also got engaged. And so four of us together said, this has to become at least as good as Hyderabad, if not better. So we said, what is it you, you can do? So each one of us took the responsibility of putting up an additional institute at the campus, which you all know, uh, of course, the Bharti School for Public Policy and uh, the Mac School for Healthcare and uh, Healthcare Management and uh, Punjlaut uh, School for Infrastructure and the Munjal School for Global Manufacturing. Each of them, in their own way, added something which had never been done on any campus of any business school in the world. There was a bit of uh, flutter in the early days. We said, are we, are we taking on too much? But the moment we started talking to people outside, he said, this would give you a unique strength because each of these is a crying need, not just of India, but of literally each and every developing economy across the globe. So you can provide expertise to the world as well. And Hyderabad was designed as an open platform to bring in the best in the world. So this gave us an additional fillip. So this has been an amazing journey. And, and Madan was right when he says, the board has constantly pushed for the institution to look forward at the next horizon and the next horizon. Because this is not a race you want to stop at any time soon. You want to keep going. And as I said, it is important that we enjoy the journey as much as we are looking at a long-term horizon, which will be a, hopefully a phenomenal and a fantastic uh, goal. Because while it's number one in India, I'll repeat the words Madan said, it is not good enough. We have to do more. We have to get better. We have to improve, improve our reach. We have to improve our research. We have to improve overall 
the ecosystem in which it operates, including helping many, many more become entrepreneurs, getting engaged and involved in new ideas, in innovation, in research, and truly serving the needs of society and the world. So many, many congratulations to each and every one of you. Many congratulations to everyone of, at ISB. We see the celebrities, we see the big faculty. There are many others, faceless, nameless, who are working tirelessly to make sure everything works, everything runs. The dining, the cleanliness, the, the operation, the maintenance. So I'd like to say a big thank you today to all of them for the amazing work that they do to allow us to take credit for the work that they do. So thank you all very much. Many congratulations, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Munjal. I now invite Shyamish Tripathi, director of the Nehru Center, for, to say a few words, please. Namaste, everyone. Welcome uh, to the Nehru Center. Uh, regrettably, I did not do my MBA at ISB uh, because I did my MBA before ISB was formed. Uh, I did it from IIM Calcutta, batch 95 to 97. Uh, so let me talk about something that is common between ISB and IIM Calcutta, between the Indian School of Business and the Indian Institute of Management, India, uh, the country that we all love. A rising tide lifts all boats. It is, it is one of the most exciting times to be born an Indian, one of the most exciting times in many centuries to be born an Indian. Uh, and I thought, how about if I summarize what's happening with India uh, through the tale of our primary three goddesses. We are among the last surviving goddess-worshipping cultures. So how about if we approach what's happening with India through uh, the way we worship Goddess Lakshmi, uh, Goddess Shakti and Goddess Saraswati. So the first, Goddess Lakshmi. 1947, uh, we were left in a pretty bad state by the British Raj, uh, but regrettably we chose socialism after that, uh, which has an unparalleled track record of economic destruction wherever it has been tried. And so we regrettably continued our descent, uh, even post-independence. Uh, uh, we woke up in 1991 and that's when it started changing. Uh, and once the dead hand of socialism was removed, the entire world understood we Indians know how to worship Goddess Lakshmi. This year, our GDP will cross the GDP, or in fact, it already has the GDP of our former colonial master, the UK. We know how to worship Goddess Lakshmi. Indians in the UK uh, form approximately a 1.5% uh, of the population, we contribute 6% of the UK's GDP. We know how to worship Goddess Lakshmi. Just the dead hand of socialism has to be removed. We are good at it. How about Goddess Shakti? There is, uh, I am a diplomat, you are in a diplomatic institution, you are technically on Indian soil, so I'll have to be a little careful with my words on this, but there is a certain neighboring country of ours, uh, a certain authoritarian communist country, uh, which is uh, a source of uh, dismay and trouble to many uh, countries across the world. We are the only ones who have actually fought them in the last few years. We push them back. We know how to fight. We know how to worship Goddess Shakti as well. Uh, our, our army, our armed forces, even in, uh, uh, even in peacekeeping services uh, across have conducted themselves with with honor. Uh, and even when we have fought back wars, such as in Kargil, we all know uh, that uh, there were Pakistani soldiers out there who'd come in in the garb of, of uh, non-state actors. Uh, and after many years, they did acknowledge that they were Pakistani soldiers. Uh, but they refused to take, many don't know this, they refused to take the bodies back of the Pakistani soldiers who are soldiers killed. Uh, but our army is an honorable army. We did the final rites for those soldiers, even when their own did not accept them back. And that's what Goddess Shakti would accept of, expect of us. We know how to fight, but we know how to worship her in an honorable way. We are good at that as well. Let's come to the last one, worshiping Goddess Saraswati. 
the domain of knowledge, the domain of culture. We are good at absorbing knowledge that comes, that has been generated uh, across the world. Uh, we have, uh, there are companies across the world where we become CEOs. Uh, there are uh, uh, B schools, engineering colleges in, uh, in India, which are very good at absorbing the knowledge that has been generated in the West and disseminating it and using it. But let's be honest, we haven't generated as much knowledge as our ancestors did relative to the rest of the world. Uh, there are three million Sanskrit manuscripts that survive till today, ancient handwritten Sanskrit manuscripts. That's more than the rest of the ancient world combined. That's how Kekas our ancestors were in knowledge production. That's an area perhaps we need to become better at. We are good at absorbing knowledge. Are we truly generating knowledge as our ancestors did? We are a culture that is uh, economically and uh, you know, seen across the world and academically as good achievers, but is our culture actually impacting the outside world as well? Perhaps we have started impacting, but maybe not as well uh, as we could. So how about if we focus, and we should continue to worship Goddess Lakshmi, we do need that, and Goddess Shakti, we need our protection, but how about if we improve the way we worship Goddess Saraswati as well. One of the things I love most about ISB, uh, as compared to many other B schools, very good at uh, research, very good at knowledge production. Our institutions need to do that a lot more. Uh, that's the thought I want to leave with you guys, uh, uh, and pleasure having you here. Thank you. And, and of course, I get to invite uh, uh, my friend Subhu up on stage to deliver his remarks, who also is fortunately a fellow I am Calcutta alum. <laughs> I'm claiming him. <laughs> A very good evening, everyone. <clears throat> and uh, thanks to the Nehru Center, very good friend and senior of mine from IIM Calcutta, Amish, uh, for organizing this event and giving me the opportunity to share. Uh, I think, le let me... Uh, confess that at the end of the presentation, you might think that because we are seniors, we actually had a conversation about what we're going to talk. <laughs> but let me confess, you know, he spoke independently and I'm going to speak independently of mine, but it's in some sense uh, what I'm going to speak about, you know, the preambling for that uh, has been done wonderfully well by Amish. Um, <clears throat> so let me, before I uh, speak on what I think is a very important part where we can indeed worship Goddess Saraswati. And I, I think he said it absolutely right that, you know, compared to our ancestors uh, who were indeed kick-ass in, you know, worshipping uh, Ma Saraswati and creating knowledge, we haven't done enough. Um, and my talk will be, therefore, on, on that broad topic. But let me just quickly, given that this is such a wonderful occasion to celebrate ISB, uh, let me share my own uh, perspective, it's, it's, maybe it's coincidental, but the idea of ISB when it germinated was the time when the idea of me getting involved in ISB also germinated. Um, I still recall, um, you know, I was, I'd gotten admitted to the PhD program, uh, this was in the year 2001, and I read a news clipping saying that there's going to be a research institution that's going to start in India. So I read that news clipping and showed it to my dad, uh, to my father, and told him that I'll come back to this institution. Um, this was in 2001 because I had my sights very clearly that I, would, I was coming back to India. Um, and uh, I, I think what Madan, share, Madan shared, the ability to sort of relate, um, I'll just mention an anecdote. I still remember this very well, you know, uh, to be able to uh, uh, sort of in, your, in the class give examples and, and anecdotes. Um, a particular batch, so I have this tendency to use examples from Bollywood and cricket in, in class. And so I don't remember which batch it was, but on the first class, I actually mentioned I was giving, you know, I'd given maybe a few examples, maybe one too many from Bollywood and cricket. So there's this, uh, you know, smart kid, and some of them, you know, really push you, and especially um, uh, in the first class. So this kid says, uh, Prof, are you going to also give us? pre-reads on Bollywood and cricket. 
Um, now, as you would imagine, you know, that had me stumped. Um, I hadn't certainly prepared for that, but thankfully I ga gathered my wits and I then <laughs> retorted back and said that, my dear friend, if you need pre-reads on cricket and Bollywood, the women here, watch out, this is not the guy to hang around with. <laughs> um, but I, I think the, the, the ability to relate, I think, is something that I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I've been here at ISB since, the, since 2010. Uh, I visited in 2009. So I've been there for 12 years. And I must mention um, that, for instance, uh, Madan spoke about me going on leave. Um, I, I genuinely am in indebted to this institution because um, you know, I always wanted to come back to a, a research-driven institution. You know, um, with, with, with all due respects to, the, to my alma mater, the you know, I am Calcutta, which trained me. But you know, it's good to be there as a student, but I'm not quite sure I would have gone there as a faculty. Um, I certainly have come back to ISB and I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, being there as a faculty, continue to be there as well. Um, so that's, I think, is uh, if we are voting with our feet, I have certainly voted with my feet. Um, being there in ISB just tells how well the institution has taken care of me, has given me the opportunities to actually contribute to the nation. Um, so what I'm going to share, um, is I think I thought this is um, a good point to um, to look at the long run. If you, those of you who've been watching the Indian economy um, during the COVID period, and that many, and you know, um, those of you who follow me on social media, Twitter or LinkedIn, would have seen some of my presentations. India has been the positive outlier um, in its COVID policy and having been at the thick you know, um, of, um, of, of things there. Um, you know, we were the only country which actually recognized that COVID is going to be a, is going to be a huge supply side shock and therefore implemented supply side measures. And even on the demand side, we were far more careful and did, you know, rather than just giving $5,000 checks that even kids at the University of Chicago get. And, um, you know, I say that from experience. Um, uh, instead of that, we actually did very well targeted spending. Um, I've written about this in, uh, you know, in, in Times of India and other, other outlets. Um, please do go and check there. Uh, so I don't want to actually sp speak about that, but I think the fact that the rest of the world can learn from India's economic policy during COVID is, I think, a signal that things are changing. Gone are the days when those of us who basically are educated in English in particular would bend down every time we basically saw someone from the advanced economy and said, that person knows more than, more than me. No. I think times are changing. And I want to set the perspective by taking on cue what Amish sp spoke about, you know, what our ancestors created. And therefore, I think, especially among the group of us who speak English, who are trained in English, I think it's this absolutely uh, it's imperative that we Indianize Indian thought. And that's what my talk is going to be about. Th you know, I, th I don't think there can be a better blessing to give to Ma Saraswati um, you know, uh, than, than really focus on Indianizing Indian thought. Um, so why is this important? Um, this research that was actually done, um, you know, uh, Pew Research, um, looked at the attitudes to religion across the world. Um, showed that I think here India is a particular outlier. 97% Indians believe God is important in their life. This is significantly lower for the advanced economies. For the other economies, this is around, the percentages are anywhere between 50 to 60%. You know, some, some countries even lower than that. But India, 97%. And this is still when India has just crossed the colonial masters to become the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, next slide. Can I have a clicker, please? Is this the one? OK. Um, so if you look at, and this is not something, this is not driven by a particular religion. Um, if you look across religions, I think this is, it's common that you know, the number of, or percentage of, of Indian adults who actually believe in religion, you know, that's where India is very different. Um, next slide. Keep going. Yeah, you can look across the religions, actually. It's true. Next slide, please. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, I'd really prefer actually controlling it myself. Yeah. Um, this salient difference um, for India vis-a-vis -vis the West, um, I don't think is a function of material prosperity because historically, even times when India was a prosperous nation, and I will talk about that, even then India always believed in, uh, you know, in, 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 in religion. And if you look at, you know, Sanatan Dharm, uh, the, the term in, trans, in Sanskrit itself translates as basically Sanatan is something that has always been there. You know, there's no beginning, there's no end. Um, it's a way of life. Dharm, dharm as actually as a way of life, not in a very insular religious uh, um, sort of, uh, 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 you know, institution. Um, it's a way of life, not dogmas that, that change with material prosperity. Um, so question that arises, and you know, uh, having written the economic survey that, um, you know, that, that I uh, feel very privileged to have contributed to, that ethical wealth creation should be the way for India to actually become a prosperous entity. Uh, I think the question that has always, you know, I've struggled with, um, especially given um, some of the people whom I've actually benefited, you know, from their advice during my PhD programs, et cetera, is, you know, should the economic policy or should economics itself, should that be separate from the rest of the world? Um, now, you know, it, it's quite common why, if you look at, in, you know, among many educated Indians, we tend to sort of be very, very idolatry towards the West. Um, and that's not, uh, you know, uh, that's not unanticipated, that's not surprising, you know, when... I. Yeah, and my train of thought breaks when you actually speak, you know, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, so where was I? I was talking about the fact that, um, can you just go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So when we look at, you know, those of us who are, um, you know, who've been educated in, uh, in English in particular, we tend to be very, very idolatry towards, um, you know, Western ideas. Uh, and I think that's not unexpected, especially, you know, when you see material prosperity, um, and that material prosperity has indeed been there for the last, you know, couple of centuries, you do think that maybe they are doing, something is right about that, about, you know, maybe some, they are soon doing something right. And therefore, uh, there is, it's alluring to actually uh, think that whatever, you know, a more prosperous society does might be the right thing to do. Um, and therefore, you know, it, this is sort of the right moment for us to start thinking about these questions. But I think, as Amish was also saying, you know, possibly the only surviving civilization. And therefore, our cultures actually far, far predate, you know, many of us. Um, can economic development be contrary to, you know, to India's DNA? I think this is a question that is extremely important. In which case, then the question arises is what is India's DNA? And how, does, how do we relate you know, to um, some of the debates about secularism, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that, um, that, that we're having? So uh, if we move on, this is a slide. This was the first chart in the economic survey on ethical wealth creation drawn from Angus Madison's work. Um, most of us actually think that the West has always been prosperous and that therefore, you know, ideas from the West are the ones that should be copy-pasted onto India. But I think when we take a much more, much longer expanse of history, uh, I, and, and I, I think that is quite important, I want you to focus on that um, space shown in yellow, which is India, and I've marked that with the arrow. Uh, now, the scale on the x-axis here is not linear. Um, that first unit is just 1,000 years, 1 to 1,000. The rest of them actually is covering one, you know, another 1,000 another years. But what is critical is if you observe until 1750 AD, that's three quarters of known economic history. Three quarters of known economic history, India was by far the leading economic power in the world. And till about... 1080, in fact, had a much higher GDP per capita as well. Some people who actually want to more hang on to this notion that you know, the West was always better will say, oh, it is because of the population. But we have to recognize that you know, in, 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 in those times, 
people would move to geographies where prosperity was higher. So population itself was endogenous, and therefore you can't dismiss population, you know, and say um, this was not, this is not important. So up until, you know, 1750, 80, three quarters of known economic history, India was the, you know, uh, uh, by far the, the, the leading economic power, you know, accounted for more than one third of world's GDP consistently, consistently. Just as a comparison, just as a comparison, you know, uh, because it always helps to actually think or use contemporary benchmarks. Let's take the United States, which has been the leading economic power in the world. How long has the United States has been, you know, been, been this leading economic power? About half a century. Has accounted for about, you know, th um, at, at its peak, uh, a little more than one third of world's GDP, but on average, about 27, 28 um, percent. Just imagine. India was the leading economic power for 17 and a half centuries. That is 35 times longer than what we would basically, you know, uh, um, associate as the leading economic power, the ones that we as associate the, the best economic ideas with, so 35 times longer. In other words, there is something there. And let's, let's, let's acknowledge that that kind of dominance cannot just be pure happenstance. That kind of dominance had to come because of the quality of ideas that led to the dominance. So there is something there which we basically, we, we as Indians for sure, will benefit from by going actually studying what is it that led to that, you know, that kind of dominance. And that is what I want to intend and that's, you know, this keynote is focused on that so that we actually have the uh, long run vision, really start thinking about, you know, what is it that led to that kind of dominance. And I'm going to give you some glimpses of what I thought, what I think actually this is an ongoing, you know, uh, project where eventually cul culminating in a book. Um, but I think this is, this is uh, very important for, for, you know, institutions like ISB, its alumni, its faculty to think about. Uh, let's move on. <clears throat> so, because economics in any society can never be departed from its sociology, and in fact, if you go and read Arthashastra, or if you read, you know, in the, in the language that I speak, Tamar, um, Tiruvalluvar, Saint Tiruvalluvar, uh, in, in Tirukkural, um, you know, wrote about this 3,500 years back. You know, each one of those philosophers always wrote about the economic aspects after talking about the society as well. So I think it's very important for us to not depart the uh, you know, economics from its sociology. So I'm going to give you some, uh, you know, some thoughts on why I think in, uh, what, what India's DNA was. It was a DNA of, that basically led to creativity and liberalism. Liberalism, but seen in, you know, uh, not necessarily in the, um, you know, bl blinkers that we have in today's milieu, but liberalism as basically just open-mindedness. Um, and that's what led to the, that was what was underlying its economic thought. Um, that liberalism led to tolerance, um, in, in turn to, you know, enormous creativity and prosperity, which I've already uh, mentioned. Next slide. So let me first uh, talk about liberalism and tolerance. Move on. Many of us would have heard this particular expression, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, being uh, told. Uh, the origin of this comes from the Maha Upanishads. Um, the, the, the shloka that goes is, I am Nijaha Paro Veti Ganana Lagu Chetasam Udara Charitanam to Vasudeva Kutumbakam. I am Nijaha. This is mine. Paro Veti. That is not mine. Ganana Lagu Chetasam. Ganana is basically calculation. That, that's the kind of calculation that is made by a small minded person. Ganana laghu chetasam. Udara charitanam to vasudaiva kutumbakam. Udara charitam. Consciousness that actually is broad. For them, the entire world is a family. If there is an idea that I think is all-encompassing, you know, and, and liberal, I think this indeed captures that. Indeed, if you, you know, go and read the Garuda Purana, there is where actually, you know, the Indian prayers have never been about, you know, help my community, help my, you know, particular clique. No, it's always been for, for you know, for, for world peace, world, pros world prosperity. Sarvesham mangalam bhuya, sarve santu niramaya, sarve badrani pashyantu ma kashti dukkha bhag bhavet. Next slide. And I think the pinnacle of this um, comes from the Bhagavad Gita. 
18 chapters of uh, a conversation between um, two sakhas. In the 18th chapter, after having explained, you know, the three, three ways, bhakti marga, the gyan marga, the karma marga, all the intricacies and the details, at the end of that, and, you know, having given all the discourse, all the knowledge, then Sri Krishna says, itite gyanam akhyatam guhyat guhyataram maya vimrishyaita deshesh vimrishyaita sheshena yathechasi tathakuru and I've actually highlighted the part which is actually important here yathechasi tathakuru what you think you act accordingly now imagine this is whom we consider actually uh, the sort of uh, the divine even the divine is not saying hey thou have to actually act only in this manner no I have given you all the knowledge. I have given you the trade-offs. You act now the way you think is right. Yathechasi tathakuru. I think if we reflect on this, this is indeed, you know, sort of capturing that depth of liberal thought. Even God is not asking humans basically to say, you have to do this. He's asking humans to exercise discretion. We wake and make a choice. Pinnacle of liberal thought. Next slide. What did this kind of liberal, you know, liberal ideals that led to tolerance actually, uh, you know, uh, um, manifested as in terms of creativity? I'm going to just give you a few examples. Um, let's start with the, you know, th these, philand philand these, these uh, palindromic, comp you know, compositions are typically taken as sort of the pinnacle of creativity. This sentence, Abel was I, I saw Elba, is often quoted as a great example of a palindromic sentence. In English, it was created in the 19th century. Abel was I, I saw Elba. Let's contrast that to a composition, you know, in the 14th century. This is the Ramakrishna Viloma Kavyam by Surya Pandit, Devagya Surya Pandit. It's a 400 word palindromic composition in the 14th century. When you read it forward, it is the story of Ramayana. You read it backward, it is the story of, it's the story of, forward it's the story of Rama, backward is the story of Krishna. It's a 400 word, and you know, there are examples that I've actually put, up, put out there. 400 words versus six words. Abel was I, I saw Elba. And you know, you can imagine that creating a palindromic composition, when you increase the number of words, the difficulty, the complexity, just increases in a convex manner, not in a linear manner. 400 words versus six words. And look at the idea behind it as well. Abel was I, I saw Elba is actually an innocuous you know, sentence, um, not very profound. In contrast, the two most iconic characters being captured in this composition, read forward Rama, read backward Krishna. I think if it, this is not creativity or the pinnacle of creativity, what else is? Next slide. Tirukkural, which I was very, very fortunate to, to, to be exposed to uh, in a young, at, at, at a young age. Tiru is holy, Kural is you know, concise. Um, the beauty of Tirukkural is, if for, for instance, I tell you, go and read shloka number 46, you will know it is in the fifth chapter. Why? Because every chapter has exactly 10 verses. Exactly 10 verses. And this is across almost 133 chapters. 1,330 couplets. Each of those couplets contains exactly seven words. Exactly seven words. Just imagine how difficult it would be to actually capture across you know, 133 chapters, 1,330 couplets. Each of them seven uh, words exact. Starts with the first letter in Tamar, A, ah, and ends with the last letter in Tamar, M. Mm. There are three parts to it. And so this is, you know, uh, um, 3,000 to 500 BC, you know, 500 BC, so almost 3,500 years back. Three parts which are basically called in Tamar, Aratthapal, Porulpal, and Kamatthapal. Pal in Tamar means essence. So it has the essence of all the virtues, of all the material prosperity, Purulpal, 
and desires Kamatapal. And this tribute actually was a famous poet, uh, Avayar, talks about the Tirukural and what she says is that Tiruvalluvar took wisdom equal to the water in the seven seas and compressed it into a mustard seed. Imagine you know, the entire water of the seven seas getting compressed into a mustard seed. That's how profound um, you know, th this, this, this is. And not even from a literary perspective as well, you know, such creativity. Again, I couldn't agree more with Amish that our ancestors did far, far better in terms of actually contribute or were far, far, you know, uh, um, eligible worshippers of Ma Saraswati than, than we are. And I think we have to at least make an effort to reverse some of that during our lifetimes. Prosperity, and I think this is the, the, the most important part for me as a as, as, as an business school professor. Um, let's uh, move on. <clears throat> I've already spoken about this, but let's move. Let's look at what were the ideas that led to, the, led to this prosperity. Next slide. This is the idea that we actually wrote about in the economic survey, that when you go and read the Arthashastra or go and look at what, you know, what led to prosperity, it was indeed dharmic capitalism. It was through the marriage of the invisible hand of the market, you know, a, a term that very you know, uh, uh, eloquently was coined by Adam Smith. But the spirit of that existed you know, in India long, long back. So you know, private enterprise or capitalistic model as captured by the invisible hand of the market, but married with the hand of ethics or dharma. And that's how the, you know, dharma, earth, kama, moksha, the fourth purusharthas, you know, that, is, that are recommended in, uh, you know, Vedanta was actually taken care of as well. <clears throat> Next slide. When we look at the economic model itself, and I, I, I'll give you some glimpses of the economic model, this economic model actually stood on five pillars. Markets and private enterprise. So it's actually quite odd that India chose to go the socialistic model. It was, of course, in my opinion, and I could be speculating here, it was because of you know, lack of adequate awareness of India's own history. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the need to encourage wealth creation. Sri Suktam, for instance, which comes in the Rig Veda, Sri Suktam, it's a hymn to the goddess of wealth. We've not been a society that has actually shunned wealth. We've, in fact, you know, respected and uh, paid obeisance to wealth. Socialism was actually just anathema to that, to that entire idea. Sustainable growth, something that actually, in, especially in today's world of climate change, um, I think there are important ideas that can be borrowed from, you know, from, from India's traditional thought. Um, respect of property rights, which is actually a very, very critical element of any capitalistic society and ideas on state taxes and public goods, which was not rapacious. No, those ideas were not rapacious capitalism, as, I, as I'll, I'll give you examples of. Next slide. <clears throat> so India's ideas actually, unfortunately, have not gotten as much attention. Some scholars have actually written about it, but typically these scholars have, you know, maybe, maybe endogenously have been at the periphery, not have been, they haven't gotten the, the, the um, attention that they deserve. Um, if you read Spengler, you know, in a 1971 book published by the Duke University Press, and I'm picking up a quote from his book, he says, it is in the Arthashastra by, by uh, Kautilya that economic discussion was most highly developed, much more fully than one finds in classical Greek economics. And, you know, having had the privilege of learning the economic literature, I and I say it very, very responsibly, to me, the father of modern econo or father of economics, father of modern economics would possibly or would definitely be Adam Smith, but the father of economics is not Adam Smith, it is Cortilia. <clears throat> Spengler writing on Cortilia says that the root of wealth, and this I think just uh, reflect on the ideas here, you know, uh, root of wealth is economic activity and lack of it brings material distress. Absent fruitful economic activity, both current prosperity and future growth are in danger of, destru of destruction. And then, you know, Kautila exhorts the king to remove all obstructions to economic activity. What is the ease of doing business if not that? Removing obstacles to, to economic activity. 
Olivell, in a 2013 book, you know, published by the Oxford University Press, says Arthashastra as a treatise on economic policy was deeply influential in India till the 12th century. Some very powerful ideas were discarded after that. Next slide. A key contributor to India's prosperity was private enterprise. Internal and external trade was done through two major highways, the Uttara Partha and the Dakshina Partha. Ports connected India to Egypt, Rome, Greece, Persia, and Arabs to the west, and with China, Japan, and Southeast Asia to the east. My good friend and, and colleague in the North Block, Sanjeev, has written about this. Trade was carried out by large corporatized guilds that were akin to today's multinationals funded by temple banks. And Arthashastra actually in, the, in, in chapter 16, Cautilia mentions the specific duties of the king's superintendent of commerce, which would actually be in today's day would be the minister of commerce. Mariners and merchants who import foreign merchandise shall be fa favored with remission of trade taxes so that they may derive profit. In fact, Cautilia you know, had the provision for those who wanted to you know, sell their foreign traders who want to sell their wares in India for them to be given quarters as well to stay. So they were actually very welcome. Uh, thus, commerce and wealth was intrinsic to India's DNA. Next slide. The importance, the emphasis on sustainable growth through dharmic capitalism, this was a very key you know, aspect of, because dharma received as much emphasis as artha. Artha as wealth, dharma, but you know, ethics. And I think that is something which particularly became, becomes germane in business schools. Now we're actually you know, having classes on ethics, but I think the overall training right from the beginning on dharma was very important. Tiruvalluvar in Tirukkural actually talks about this, saying wealth yields righteousness and, righteousness and joy. The wealth acquired capably without causing any harm. I think climate change today would definitely be taken as, you know, uh, 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 as, as economic activity that creates harm, that does not satisfy that particular principle of wealth being created without, without any harm. Public goods, externalities due to climate change, pollution, all of them are clearly included in that. And I think more mundanely, if you look at our own you know, homes, we often write Shubh Lab. You know, if you go to the alt altar of a temple you know, in, in our homes, we write Shubh Lab. Nobody writes there Ashub Lab or Shubh Hani. So the concept that, you know, that, that doing good and thereby creating prosperity was intrinsic to our culture. Even Adam Smith, in fact, and this is you know, unfortunate that these ideas have been discarded. You know, Adam Smith, in the theory of moral sentiments, actually says that combine, to combine moral living and reasonable pursuit of material desires, not rapacious capitalism, um, not the credo of greed is good that the New York Times had very famously claimed in the New York Times in, in, in the 1980s. Um, and it contrasts also to the value neutrality of, neutrality of modern economics, which I have a problem with. Um, I think, you know, uh, if, if you go back to the Indian economic thought, it is not value neutral. It actually emphasizes very, very importantly, uh, crucially, that values are important for the, you know, for, for the hand of ethics to be strong. It's as if, think about, and this is the metaphor that I, that I, I love giving students, that you know, if you have a river that is banked well, the water flows, and that water creates prosperity. That flow of water, that is basically the work of the invisible hand of markets. But those two banks, those banks are the hands of, that's the hand of ethics. When those banks fall off, water goes helter-skelter and just creates, you know, a lot of destruction. Equally true for the economy as well. Um, and I think global financial crisis and the Indian banking uh, sector crisis itself is evidence of this. My advisor, Luigi Zingales, has done some work on the importance of trust and ethics and how that led to the entire global financial crisis. Um, next slide. I, I just mentioned some time back that the Sri Suktam in Rigveda actually, uh, it's a, Rigveda, as you all know, is the oldest text known to mankind. In the, Sri, in the Rigveda itself, the uh, prayer to, to Goddess Lakshmi is very much there. Sri Suktam is a hymn to actually to, to, to that to that goddess. Um, Tirukkal sp speaks about it as well. I mentioned about the that prophet was never a dirty word. We used to write Shublab in in our, in our uh, homes. I, it was extremely unfortunate then to have the first prime minister of this country of India actually saying, "Never utter the word prophet in front of me. It's a dirty word. It was never a dirty word in our culture." Strong property rights, and I think this is very important. If you look at the Western principle of eminent domain. That principle of eminent domain actually allowed go governments to confiscate land from landowners. 
Eminent domain is a Latin phrase that means supreme lordship, supreme lordship or ultimate sovereignty of God. And it is this principle that was used actually to be able to grab land. The king would grab land. Roman law and Magna Carta of 1215 CE recognized eminent domain for the state. This is at the root of rapacious behavior by the state, which today we all, you know, economics and corporate governance scholars worry about. The Shukla Yajurveda, on the other hand, actually says even king must not appropriate others' wealth. Sage Narada and Narada Muni, we all actually know about, or at least have heard stories about. In his Dharma Shastra, Narada Smriti says that the householder's living space and his field are considered as the fundamentals of his existence. This is talk of property rights, actually saying that his living space and his field are actually fu fundamental to his existence. Therefore, let not the king take either of them, for that is at the root of, you know, th that is the root of householder. And I think there are many examples of kings actually being exhorted to follow these principles as well. Next slide. Similarly, if you look at the Shanti Parva in the, in the Mahabharata, this is book 12, chapter 8, there's the quote there, wealth brings about accession of wealth, the way de domesticated elephants are used to capture wild elephants. This idea that capital can actually beget more capital was indeed captured there, saying wealth brings about accession of, accession of wealth, the way domesticated elephants are used to capture wild elephants. Look at the contrast, Aristotle, you know, great scholar, I have a lot of respect for, but in this particular idea, there's a contrast, it says money is barren and cannot produce money, but we know today, you know, from modern economics that money actually can produce more money, and that is why the concept of time value of money. The grammarian Panini expressed interest payments in percentage terms in 700 BCE. In other words, the cost of capital and the fact that cap money itself can actually, you know, generate more money was part of the uh, Indian economic thought. So capital and rental cost of capital were concepts that were part of the Ind ancient Indian economic thought. Finally, state taxes and public goods. Um, if you look at the Mahabharata, again, Shanti Parva, it's, it's like a king should tax his kingdom like a honey bee gathering honey from flowering plants. This is an idea where the state and the citizen are actually, you know, are, are seen in symbiotic relationship. Honey going and plucking, you know, uh, um, honey, basically, but at the same time also helping to, 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 to with cross-pollination, and that is a symbiotic relationship. In a similar way, if you look at, you know, uh, Kalidasa in the Raghuvansam, Raghuvansam actually he says, the state collects taxes for the greater welfare of its citizens, so welfare policy through fiscal policy is also being talked about. Um, in the same way as the sun evaporates water to form clouds, only to return it manifold in the form of rain. Contrast these ideas with the Jean Baptist Col Colbert says the art of taxation consists in plucking the goose as to procure the highest quantity of feathers with the least possible hissing. Think that metaphor itself, that contrast in metaphors, one is about actually the state grabbing, another is about the state having a symbiotic relationship with its, with its citizen. So the simile of plucking the goose is exploitative while the simile of honeybee and cloud is actually one capturing the symbiotic relationship. Similarly, you know, public goods were talked about. There is, you know, going back to Mahabharata itself, when, when Narada Muni visits, visits Yudhishthira, asks him about, have you created the, the you know, tanks for, for water, public goods? Um, and, you know, Tirukkural also talks about it 3,500 years back. Next slide. When I look back, actually, and you know, we, people will ask, why is it that if these ideas, such powerful ideas were there, why did we actually, you know, become so poor? I think there's a reason, because we actually disbanded those ideas. Starting from the 12th century onwards, the influence of many of these powerful ideas actually started waning. In particular, uh, during, the, during the British era, um, I think these, these ideas basically, especially the, the use of markets and, you know, private enterprise was, uh, was really uh, um, inhibited. The, it started with the Seven Years' War culminating the Battle of Plassey. Um, that's when if you start seeing, you know, in Angus Madison's chart as well, India's real sort of sharp decline starts. Uh, scholars who've been here, you know, um, visited this nation, Dadawai Naroji and R.C. Dutt, have actually highlighted the inimical effects of abuse of markets. Um, 
they said that british economic policies distorted markets and i think this is further testimony to the importance of dharmic capitalism or of private enter enterprise saying so he basically said that economic policies distorted markets in Brit britain's favor at india's expense so you know sometimes you find commentary saying that you know the imperialism was basically uh, the fact that we should not therefore have markets that's a wrong interpretation it was actually the undermining of markets and or or exploitation of markets to the benefit of you know the colonial power that actually led to india's penury uh, you know tariffs were imposed that favored british exports at the expense of indian entrepreneurs artificial exchange rates actually something that today we actually understand very well we you know had had tilted the trades uh, the terms of trade towards britain and that's what eventually led to you know the the degradation of value added activities um, from you know doing lots of value added activities then indian uh, uh, india became just an exporter of raw materials over time because of the you know undermining of markets and and private enterprise in fact and this was it it was that was not the end you know on the one hand they actually undermined markets you know and to recreate so much penury but at the same time also you know appealed to markets conveniently when they had to faced with famine they actually rationalized non intervention when they were intervening in these in these diabolical manners for so long rationalized non intervention saying intervening would violate principles of free trade and free enterprise quite rich i think uh, people like you know virmani arvind virmani my predecessor in the north block has actually written about how india you know continue disastrously with the same ideas even after independence and only after 1991 did we start actually worshiping you know uh, goddess lakshmi and the i think the benefits are very much uh, there for all of us to see um move on so let me conclude by summarizing that it is very important for us to really think about the ideas that led to the kind of prosperity that made india you know what it was up until 1750 uh, ad india was by far the most prosperous nation in the world and a lot of the ideas that are today part of the economist toolkit were ideas that actually had been written about 3000 you know 2500 2000 years you know back um, and and i think it is those ideas that actually led to the led to such prosperity so all of us who are privileged enough to 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 receive this kind of education to be in other countries um i think there is that we have a duty and i would actually capture that duty the best by quoting from bhagavad gita again chapter 3 shloka 21 yad yad acharati shreshtatah tat tat evet rojanah sayat pramanam kurute lokas tat anuvartate yad yad acharati shreshtatah shresht is basically the privilege people like us the way we behave yat yat acharati shreshtatah tat tat evet rojanah that's how people who are not as privileged as us as us they they actually follow us so it behooves us to actually behave in a way that we inspire them positively part of the reason why actually i chose this topic and on my twitter linkedin accounts etc i really try to propagate indian ideas is because you know Uh, uh, the almighty has given me that privilege to be able to influence at least a couple of people positively i do not want to continue influencing them saying the western ideas are great keep following them so yad yad acharati shreshtatah tat tat evet rojanah sayat pramanam kurute and it's not talk is cheap talk is not enough so yad yad sayat pramanam kurute in other words the proof of behavior sayat pramanam kurute lokas tat anuvartate it's not enough just to talk the actions have to actually back that talk as well walk the talk so i would end uh, my my uh, talk and i appreciate your patience with a humble prayer that as indians especially as indians that have been privileged to actually receive the kind of education that puts us in a place like here it is our responsibility to actually really propagate indian ideas and you know one is not asking for propagation of any ideas that are not there these are all ideas that are very much there i think it is just representation of what is indeed you know india's contribution to the world thank you very much
Thank you very much, Subhu, uh, for that uh, brilliant exposition. Uh, and uh, I think there's so much that you packed in the last uh, 30, 40 minutes, uh, sort of, you know, when you spoke about the Tirukural sort of bringing in knowledge from seven seeds into a small, tiny mustard seed, I think what you tried to do was somewhat similar to try and get us uh, sort of a master class. Uh, I want to thank you again very much for doing this. Uh, uh, in the normal course of our program, uh, as you know, we, this would have just followed with this uh, you know, brilliant panel that we had with Amish uh, Subhu and Mr. Munjal. Uh, however, we've just received news a few minutes ago, and I'm sure some of you have seen it on your phones as well, that the Queen died uh, this afternoon. There's been a formal, there's been an official announcement uh, by the royal pal uh, family. I just want to read out the announcement. Uh, it says, the Queen died peacefully at uh, Balmoral this afternoon. The king and the queen concert will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. So as a result of this, uh, uh, we will not be continuing with the sort of program anymore. Uh, I would request all of us to uh, you know, stand uh, to sort of observe a minute silence. Thank you. I want to <clears throat> I want to read out a message from the uh, Honorable Prime Minister, uh, who says uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II will be remembered as a stalwart of our times. She provided inspiring leadership to her nation and people. She personified dignity and decency in public life. I am pained by her demise. My thoughts are with, the fam with her family and people of the UK in this sad hour. Uh, may I also offer our condolences uh, to our friends from uh, this country and uh, Sir Dominic as, and everybody else who is here. Thank you very much. And with that, we will end this uh, program. Thank you for joining us this evening. To all those of you who are joining us online, thank you very much for joining us as well. Thank you.